Hi, everyone. I welcome you again to the UNU Inwe public event, the Science Talks. For those of you joining us for the first time, we're glad you can be here with us. Thank you. I am your host, Grace Oluwasoya. Before presenting our distinguished speaker for this morning, please, once again, let me remind you that you have we have an interactive Q&A session at the end of the presentation, at which point we will be taking your comments, questions, and any other contribution you may have. Please type your questions or comments in the Q&A chat box. We'll pick them from there at the end of pre the presentation. The topic of today's talk is developing carbon policies and industrial operations factoring carbon emissions from wildfires and heat waves. Again, if we rephrase that, how we can utilize remote sensing techniques to rethink carbon policies. Let's talk. Yeah. And Thank speaker you very much. for today is Dr. Yuan Li. I hope I got the pronunciation well. Yes, yes, very good. Yeah, thank she you very much. a Karen. research fellow at UNU Inwe here, a research fellow in Equihydrology Remote Sensing. She specializes in Equihydrology Remote Sensing, predicting mega fires and hydrological disasters, specifically monitoring vegetation temperature and soil moisture using passive and active microwave satellites. Our work has notably advanced methods in environmental hazard predictions and management through a number of projects that I'm sure she will mention during our presentation. So without further ado, let me introduce and invite Dr. Ju Yuang Li as our presenter for today. Dr. Li, over to you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Grace. Um, let me change my screen first. Uh, can you see it? Yeah, can you put it in presentation mode? Fantastic. Yes, okay. yes, yeah. okay. Yeah, thank you very much for introducing me, Grace. Uh, yes, my name is Zhu Hyun Lee. Uh, today, um, I'm going to talk about a forest paradox. Uh, uh, in the past five years, the unprecedented wildfires have occurred in major carbon sink, but this huge carbon emission is not incorporated into a carbon neutrality scheme. So I would like to discuss how much we are prepared for these disasters uh, from scientific and policy perspectives. Um, First, I will briefly uh, summarize the recent transitions in forest, country, uh, forest conditions with a focus on heat waves, and we'll uh, briefly look at the status quo of policymaking in science technology. And we'll show you uh, some examples what the uh, remote sensing technologies can do uh, to complement current operational system and assist policymakers at global society. And I will wrap up this seminar by making some suggestions for the policymaking and timber business and indigenous people. Um, so forests are quite paradoxical, although uh, it is really good carbon sink and there is a cooling effect of cooling for a long term. However, uh, on the other hand, it is also a great source of carbon emissions and uh, has the effect of heating in the short term. So previously, almost all, yeah, quite a few carbon research, not just policy, pretty much focused on climate change and this long-term cooling effect uh, for 10 to 20 years. However, short-term heating means this can be developed for several days or several weeks. Uh, so question would be uh, when this would happen is just, uh, in extreme heat events, the dry and warm condition itself is a great catalyst for more destructive fires and ecosystems can enter amplifying feedback. So when I say amplifying feedback, that means, as you can see here in equation one, when uh, if you look at T sub C, which stands for uh, canopy temperature, when the 
forest warmed up, it can automatically increase sensible heat, uh, which is expressed by H sub C in this equation one. So the warmed forest will increase the sensible heat and elevated sensible heat will warm up the uh, vegetation again. So they actually increase each other and actually heat amplifying conditions. Um, however, the land surface is not just an isolated entity, it has very strong interaction with atmospheric uh, layers. So people sometimes think that trees are just stuck there and then vegetation often considered as something like passive entity to be burned by external forces such as wind or lightning. So whenever I deliver this kind of seminar, sometimes uh, people argue that, oh, fire spread is driven by strong wind and gale. Um, however, uh, I would like to question what causes wind uh, and the storm and so on. It's actually temperature gradients. So warm air is very light, goes up and creating low pressure. And cold air is heavy, is creating high pressure. So because of this pressure gradient uh, driven by temperature gradients uh, could cause great wind. Uh, and not only just wind, uh, because this warm vegetation layer destabilize atmospheric boundary layers and convective available potential energy and so on. So there is a paper that a warmed land surface can cause storm and even lightning. So of course it's true that uh, in Canada, in case of Canada, uh, almost 50% of wildfire is actually caused by naturally occurred uh, lightning. But uh, behind this, there's a very strong role of uh, warmed vegetation layers. So when does this ground warm up? Uh, there are several factors to influence the warmed uh, vegetation layer uh, to reduce soil moisture and increase uh, vegetation temperature. Um, sometimes reforestation or forestation that we do unexpectedly uh, can make our forests more vulnerable to fire, insect, drought, and storm because it is usually single age, monoculture, and densely distributed tree farm. Or sometimes if there's too much water resource uses because of agriculture activities, then that can you know, decrease water levels and then drying the root zone areas. And heat waves, we're going to address this today. <laughs> So it's uh, very important to monitor whether the forest reach this uh, will enter this kind of uh, interactions and so on. Um, Our forest is seems to be uh, seems to transition from the carbon sink to super emitter. Uh, so, like I just explained in my previous uh, slides, we there are two different uh, mechanisms: carbon sink and carbon source. And it seems that we are sorry, we uh, yeah seems to enter uh, carbon sink. Uh, stream. So in 2004, for example, in 2023, Canadian wildfires is emit a lot of carbon, which correspond to 22% of global carbon from wildfires. And this amount of carbon is almost five times the average for the past 20 years, according to European Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. And this far exceeds the emission tied to Canada economy and triple annual climate pollution from fossil fuels. It's more than combined emissions from 100 nations. Um, if you look at the um, graph here, and around at uh, yeah, around in 2000s, uh, Canadian uh, Canada has already transitioned from carbon sink to carbon source. Source uh, not only Canada but Siberia, Siberian taiga forests also uh, transitioned from carbon sinks to uh, carbon sources in 2024, according to the same source, uh, Copernicus uh, AM uh, CAMS. The third highest carbon emission occurred in two decades after 2019 and 2020 wildfires. So Canadian wildfires and Siberian forests are just not the matter of one or two countries' national interest because boreal forests of Siberian and taiga forests and Canadian wild uh, forests are actually largest 
the world largest intact forest biome in the world. And Canada has uh, 360 million hectares of forest, and which correspond to more than 30% of Earth's boreal forests and 25% of world's temperate rainforests. So there is very uh, huge uh, global significance. Um, however, uh, super carbon emitter, this kind of things are uh, omitted from Paris Agreement and will not be counted against Canada's uh, commitment. Uh, for example, even in 2018, the governing uh, River Party pledged to build, uh, pledged to plant two billion trees within a decade. But fortunately, uh, it would be. Yeah, it looks unlikely to be fulfilled if uh, this plan had been pushed through in the middle of this kind of uh, heat waves, then it would be, uh, it would have been a very huge disaster. Uh, so like political parties and policymakers, they actually pretty much focus on carb the the carbon sink of forests. Unfortunately, you know, the recently the heat waves is actually uh, follow a totally different uh, mechanism. And also another thing that we have to pay attention to is there's a failure to report logging areas separately, transparently, and this obscure the carbon emissions caused by logging and business uh, activities and encourages uh, policy to increase the uncertainty. However, log uh, for us is already very important carbon source to atmosphere because there's carbon is coming from the soils and slash um, if you look at the graph here, uh, the logging is not the negligible. It's actually second highest carbon emission after oil and gas. So definitely that is very important to manage. And if you look at this graph in here, um, yeah, the forests are divided into managed forests and unmanaged forests. And managed means which can be used for harvesting and logging. And unmanaged forests is, is just, just protected from logging because of fire protection or recreation or wildlife predictions for and so on. So, um, yeah, so if you look at in graph here, uh, those fire affected areas is actually it's not overlapped with this harvested area. So which means that actually uh, um, wildfire usually occur in unmanaged areas where logging has not occurred yet. So I think um, if people moved into this area, although it is uninhabitable and covered by permafrost and so on, I think uh, if you enter this region and live there and harvest a little bit, and then forest fire wouldn't occur this much frequently and so large, because um, soil mo be because people do something before the soil moisture is depleted. So people will use uh, trees, and and that activities will be helpful to maintain soil moisture in the root areas. So I'm not saying that we can make like bare mountains or bare soils, but I think those activities will help us to reduce our vegetation densities so that uh, trees wouldn't uh, uh, compete for having soil moisture. Um, so I think the role of indigenous people is very important. Um, so because of that, uh, people start to think about the selective harvesting in these days. People realize it, that our forest management policies actually unexpectedly resulted in more dense, more densely distributed, more homogeneous forests, which actually makes our forests more vulnerable to fire, drought and insect, which is really not really what we want. But the question is to make the wise selective harvesting, uh, which trees and when we have to cut the trees. So that is something that we have to, we scientists have to answer. Um, However, unfortunately, uh, to better uh, to better manage logging businesses and carbon emission and wildfire, such question uh, we should know these three elements: uh, fire, heat, fuel. But unfortunately, uh, uh, this fuel, heat, vegetation, fuel, heat information or observation is not available. 
and we are we scientists are not ready to uh, give uh, some nice information about it. Uh, there are several reasons about it. Um, there was, uh, of course, there were several attempts to estimate those variables. Uh, first. Uh, traditionally, the vegetation index has been widely used to infer uh, vegetation fuel moisture. However, uh, this is quite reasonable. It makes sense to use vegetation index for like one, 10 years or 20 years of climatology studies because there will be a change in green coverages for like 20 years. However, uh, vegetation index is basically designed to detect ve uh, vegetation chlorophyll, meaning that uh, as long as its color is green, and then vegetation index will report to you that it is uh, wet. However, uh, when the forests are getting dry, that uh, that it, it may cost just several days or several weeks. So within so at the time scale of several days and several weeks, there's no change in vegetation index. It's just still green. Although it's still green, that doesn't mean so although it's still green, that doesn't mean that the trees are still moisturized. However, such a change for a short term or at several days and several weeks and the change in the moisture is not really effectively detected by vegetation index, although vegetation index is very good indicator for long term climatology uh, change. So another thing that even IPCC heavily rely on is actually land surface temperature. However, when you use a uh, MODIS land surface temperature satellite observations, uh, they don't measure forest emissivity. Uh, although forest emissivity is in principle largely affected by hydrological factors such as snow cover or or drought and so on, but it's not being measured, it's not been uh, uh, taken into account. So instead, I will show you the equation a little bit later, uh, but they assume they use it empirical formula, uh, linearly approximated with uh, a function of NDVI. And I explained NDVI really, you know, not reading short term change in soil moisture, uh, vegetation moisture. So if you use the model and they use energy balance equation, uh to retrieve land surface temperature and again they assume that land surface layer has no heat capacity however which actually increase with the vegetation water content so it's not really perfect option to monitor vegetation water uh, contents and so on and in other models uh, people often assume the air temperature can be a good proxy of ca canopy temperature and or canopy moisture however it has lower dependency on vegetation conditions than soil moisture and evaporations and these assumptions that canopy temperature can be uh, assumed to be equal to air temperature or soil temperature and this assumption is actually widely used in satellite uh, retrieval algorithms or modeling. However, this is not valid for heat wave conditions because canopy temperature is always higher than air temperature in heat waves. Oh, sorry, there is typo here. <laughs> it's not the wave, it's waves, heat waves. Yeah. So yeah, these uh, assumptions were uh, quite fine in normal conditions. However, in under heat wave conditions, this is not valid anymore. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, heat development for a short term, like to capture the tipping point to enter the vicious cycle of heat amplification mechanisms, we need a better, uh, better uh, tools to monitor them. Uh, so at the moment, we don't know whether today's wet heat waves will enter vicious cycle of forests or not. So uh, yeah, here's the alternative, what we can do, what the remote sensing can do uh, better uh, as a part of pre-fire applications. So uh, I would like to suggest uh, we can invite the new sensors, uh, which is a hydrology related satellites, which were uh, launched in 2009 and 2015. Um, if you are able to use uh, L-band microwave sensors, uh, it can better penetrate to the vegetation trunk and vegetation 
uh, branches so that we can read uh, their moisture and heat conditions better than other uh, C bands and X bands, and also as compared to MODIS thermal sensors, which is uh, highly contaminated by cloud cover and smoke cover, and this sensor wouldn't be yeah, affected by that uh, meteorological conditions. Um, so actually, we can innovatively change our conceptual uh, perceptions in satellite applications from just detection of ongoing events to the predictions ahead of flame and combustions. Um, current MODIS uh, fires usually detect in this stage in here. Uh, detect smokes and flames by color uh, after the ignitions. However, uh, we can detect the location and time when the fuel is available in the form of fire energy before it is materialized to smoke and frame so that we can make a prediction before uh, ahead of flaming. Uh, this is how we calculate and how we uh, retrieve uh, canopy temperature from satellite measurement. Uh, just please note that when we estimate land surface temperature, we need a yeah, forest emissivity here, but the NDV, uh, but MODIS and land surface is not uh, reading like this. So just for the results, uh, I found that when the canopy temperature exceeds a certain level of like threshold, the fire pretty much enter the ignition and start to largely spread. The longer they exist, this threshold, the larger the fire spread. So this is the red line is threshold. However, when there is no fire, yeah, it's always this canopy temperature was below this threshold line. So we just also compare this with um, fire spread. And although the lightning is known as the cause of uh, wildfires, and it is true that it contributes to ignition, but it seems to be unrelated to fire spread because it's kind of, you know, in you know, indirectly related. And instead, the pre-fire kind of temperature and fewer heat was more highly related to a fire spread, your burned area. So the message is that the lightning is, of course, related to ignition, but not about the fire uh, spread. Instead, uh, fewer conditions, fewer heat seems to be more related to and can be a good predictor for fire spread. So we apply this to 2014 Northwest Territory, which was the biggest wildfire before 2023. And we also apply this 2018 British Columbia. Wildfire. We continue to apply the same approach to uh, 2023 Canadian wildfires and 2021 Siberian wildfires. And uh, uh, in case of Canada, there is a snow melt and temperature. There is a snow, very complicated snow, snow melt is going on. And if you compare this with a uh, Siberian wildfire here, and temperature is higher than other uh, northern regions. So you can clearly see here that the tem uh, canopy temperature here has very high variations and fluctuations in temperature while the land surface temperature is just remained stable until the first ignition. So it did not really give clear sense that whether uh, this temperature gradient will cause wildfire or not with a land surface temperature. That is because like we just briefly discussed in the introduction you know, earlier in this presentation, uh, with land surface temperature, uh, it is difficult to parameterize, formalize these complicated uh, hydrological factors such as snow melt or heat transfer from adjacent no snow cover areas with uh, climate and weather prediction models. Um, uh, yeah. So in case of uh, Siberia, their snow is very intact and it's still frozen and very stable. So it's, I think land surface temperature is more or less well uh, covered this area. Uh, so I didn't bring the data today, but we also compare this uh, SMAP vegetation water contents, but uh, their data is based upon the vegetation index climatology. So it was just, there was no dynamics like this. It was just constant one value throughout the uh, period. Uh, 
So let me show you this snow graph uh, to show and compare the snow melt in Canada and Siberia. As you can see here, Siberia is quite, you know, quite quite good and quite homogeneous, very intact and stable. However, in Canada, there is a snow melt, very unevenly distributed and uh, very uh, complicated uh, distribution. Uh, so variation in snow cover is very large, extremely irregular. This is something that we can't easily do with uh, model parameterizations. So, um, like I briefly explained before, uh, because uh, land surface, mo uh, when we estimate land surface temperature with modelings, uh, they assume the land surface layer has no heat capacity, although yeah, they have, they have very linear uh, relationship with vegetation water contents, but they don't consider this. And, if you are using more less surface temperature observations, and then instead of measuring forest emissivity, which is highly affected by hydrodynamic factors such as snow cover, they don't measure it. They instead use this linear empirical approximations for uh, forest emissivity. So it's more like a vegetation index rather than a uh, vegetation water contents. And the limit about the limitation of vegetation index, I already uh, briefly explained about it. So accordingly, uh, land surface temperature gradient did not really show uh, much predictability for the wire spread. Instead, uh, the temperature gradient of a canopy temperature is kind of more highly correlated with a fire area. So we applied the same approach to spatial uh, distribution. So before the ignitions and fire spread, the canopy temperature uh, Pre-fire uh, canopy temperature has been well uh, elevated. Uh, and we also applied the same approach to a uh, different area, 2023 uh, Canadian wildfires and 2021 Siberian wildfires. And it seems like that uh, this yellow is elevated canopy temperature, hot reasons, and this blue is cold reason, as the canopy temperature is not increased this reason. So in this cold reasons, uh, fire did not occur. We also compared, um, uh, further compared with other fire indexes, uh, such as weather index and Moody's index. Um, you can see the difference between the prediction and detections. This is, this is Moody's active fire detection and this is a canopy temperature uh, prediction. The prediction is was quite large and uh, 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 but uh, uh, here in this Moody's active fire is a truly just detect of ongoing uh, events. Um, this D, it shows the modest maximum fire radiated power, which seems to be the most similar to fire energy that people expect to be the same. However, it turns out it seems pretty much identical to active fire uh, of ongoing events, rather, you know, having very less predictability for where the fire will go. And C is weather index, and some of the fire was successfully predicted, but some of them are not. So we also repeat the same experiment to uh, about the British Columbia. And if you look at in here and C is modest maximum fire radiative power that people assume that it will represent fire energy. However, uh, it's more like just identical with active microwave, uh, sorry, modest active fire. And if you look at D here, this is map vegetation water contents. Actually, in fire area, this vegetation water index should be lower than adjacent air areas, but it, the, the, it was totally the opposite. In fire area, vegetation water contents uh, turns out to be more higher. So it's, I think, kind of misleading information, although the name of variable is vegetation water contents. So this is a time series um, 
This is a vegetation uh, opacity. This is the variable that most of people in remote sensing uh, assume that this variable will represent vegetation water contents. However, it turns out, yeah, not really. Yeah, this is the ignition time point in this line. So before and after, there must be some change. At least, you know, this variable should be lower before the fire or, or at least after the fire occurs. But it was just, uh, yeah, there's no such a thing. And another, yeah, this is vegetation water contents again from SMAP uh, products, but because they their uh, estimation is based upon climatology, vegetation index climatology, so it's just constant like this. So we, we repeated the same experiment uh, to 2023 Canadian wildfires and 2021. Siberian wildfires, but uh, vegetation water contents from SMAP uh, show the same, just uh, just constant uh, with no dynamics. And this is surface soil moisture. However, there was no decrease in uh, surface uh, surface soil moisture before this uh, ignition and fire occurrence. So theoretically, it should be. I mean, it's good that after the fire occurrence, soil moisture is kind of decreasing, but it is, I think. There is some ambiguity uh, to be too too ambiguous to be used as a predictor for the until the fire occurs because it's kind of high. It's very wet. Uh, there are several reasons for this because vegetation cover is kind of at the source of retrieval errors in uh, small sense map uh, retriever algorithms. So I think that could be a reason. But um, uh, this is the actually take home image uh, uh, take home messages today. Um, the we capture the self heating uh, aspects of pre fire forests at the million hectare scale, and we show that forests can self condition and intensify and spread destructive wildfires. And forests have the power to intensify wildfires through this amplifying feedback. So which means uh, sensible heat increases from warmed canopy under heat waves conditions and, and further heating forests again with elevated sensible heat. So they, you know, like a synergy effect they actually increasing each other. So forests become a trigger to spread the fires. First, the fuels are drying up during this feedback. Second, a temperature gradient and uneven distribution of heat can cause wind and destabilize atmospheric, uh, atmospheric layers, which makes the land surface vulnerable to uh, insufficient to trigger a storm and lightning and so on. So data pretty much show that fire, uh, fire spreads are very large. This is why I we suppose that this is why Canadian wildfire uh, has that much uh, large spread, fire spread. So question is, should we really continue to plant more and more trees in this heat amplifying forest? This is a uh, take home messages today. So, so actually, we uh, applied the same approach to other fire wildfires. This is 2014 Northwest Territories and 2008 British Columbia wildfires, and we repeat the same experiment uh, to different wildfires in 2023 Canadian wildfires and 2021 Siberian wildfires, and we found the same correlations: cell uh, heat amplifying effect of forest. Uh, so I have, uh, yeah, almost 10 minutes. Um, so, uh, so far it was uh, the application of remote sensing technologies to pre-fire, uh, if fire, uh, pre-fire issues. And then the other stream that we can consider is uh, post-fire floodings. Uh, after the fire occur uh, fire occurrence, uh, the land surface, the property, soil property of land surface is transformed to a water repellent, uh, like here. The soil doesn't observe the water any longer. And also when there, before the fire, there's like a 
a uh, very important role of forest, such as like there's a shield and you know there's a role of sponge observe you know the waters and and filter and can be a good habitat for several uh, wildlife. However, all these uh, roles can be you know can disappear because of wildfire. So accordingly, yeah, water just water just very yeah easy to flood and so. For this, the one of the thing that we can do is actually de monitor the soil moisture level on the left surface uh, uh, for the spacious areas. And what we can do is to apply a radar, uh, sensitive aperture radar. Um, we apply this to Saskatchewan. Uh, this is the model that I'm using. Uh, as long as you have like radar signals and backscattering signals and have some information uh, for uh, uh, instrument configurations, and we can actually retrieve this. And with a little bit of uh, bias correction arising from vegetation uh, things. So this is just showing that, yeah, we can make a vegetation correct uh, vegetation bias corrections to improve the quality of soil moisture retriever. And this pretty much showing that depending on data set, actually they make sometimes underestimation, overestimation of soil moisture. So we need uh, some reliable estimation of soil moisture through bias corrections. Um, so as you can see here, uh, depending on the data sets, sometimes the information itself can uh, mislead about the about the possibility of the flooding. Uh, so still the message is same. So, so bias correction is important. Bias correction is needed when it is when this later set is applied to uh, vegetated areas because vegetation is quite a very tricky things to retrieve. Uh, so after the after the uh, after the uh, bias correction, we could pretty much observe that soil moisture. Uh, this is a spatial average of watershed scale soil moisture, spa uh, spatially averaged. We found that soil moisture increased first before the elevation of water discharge at the uh, at the river outlet. So we can just pretty much monitor the soil moisture if it is increasing and we are able to predict that we will have a flooding. Yeah, and when so. And also, uh, like I said, uh, the soil moisture uh, and soil properties can be disturbed because of wildfires and uh, but uh, most of federal government soil data does not really read or reflect this kind of external uh, externally disturbed uh, soil I, I mean federal government soil data uh, does not reflect this kind of event you know disturbed by fires so uh, what we can do is that uh, if you combining hydrological modeling and satellite observations we can pretty much update uh, the mapping of soil property which is very sensitive to hydrological modeling depending on what kind of soil property and soil data you use uh, we have a different results and quality in hydrological modeling and prediction Um, yeah, so that's pretty much I have prepared today. So uh, for the nitty gritty, um, there is the heat amplifying effect of forests under heat waves. So this seems to be very important to monitor and vegetation and sensible heat, they have kind of amplifying, uh, have, a, have something like a synergistic relationship between them. So uh, vegetation, warmed vegetation can increase sensible heat and elevated sensible heat will contribute to snow melt and destructive wildfires. And pre-fire canopy temperature is was the, seems to be a very good predictor for fire spread, and as compared to uh, land surface temperature or lightning. And the reason is that land surface temperature is often assume uh, that uh, there is no uh, change in heat con uh, capacity or or does not measure the forest emissivity correctly. So. Um, 
in a normal conditions, we can assume canopy temperature is equal to air temperature or soil temperature even. However, under heat wave conditions that we are facing with, the canopy temperature cannot be replaced by land surface temperature or air temperature, or even this predictability of canopy temperature is not something that we can see from uh, modest active or fire radiative power data, or even vegetation index, which seems, which seems to be more seems to more represent climatology change. Um, so under heat wave conditions of afforestations and reforestation can exacerbate heat wave conditions and destructive wildfires. So instead of planting more and more trees and uh, selective harvesting is very interesting to consider at this stage. Um, so for logging businesses and indigenous people, uh, it is important to note that uh, they can monitor or consider the root zone soil moisture before harvest their trees and um, selective harvesting is not something really you know destroying the carbon sink aspect of forests in under heat wave conditions it's really something that we have to uh, consider even for carbon reduction um, so rather than making just bare soils or bare mountain, uh, bare mountains, uh, we can actually decrease the vegetation density, and yeah, through through uh, timber business operations, or even indigenous people can uh, water the trees around their house, or at least harvest and cut the trees around their house to maintain soil moisture in root zone areas. Uh, the other aspects of forests as carbon emitters and logging activities as carbon reductions for this reason, because if they cut the trees and then the trees wouldn't compete to get soil moisture between them. So logging activities is not really something to uh, prevent in terms of soil moisture. So the logging activities, the other aspects of forest as a carbon emitter should be incorporated into a carbon policy and Paris Agreement. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, Let me. Uh, I'm actually very. I, I'm not sure I can say. Um, what what's the word I'm looking for? It's it's enlightening, and um, the fact that the 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 paradox. You know, I'm try, I've been trying to wave my head round. Okay, this issue of forest paradox and all that, and the ways of addressing you know how do we move ahead from here you know and i'm um, thinking around many of the climate actions has to you know incorporate environmental um measures and one of the things around that is you know plant more trees plant more vegetation you know and now Along the line, we are also saying, no, planting more trees may actually not be the answer. Are we not, as scientists, actually sending mixed signals, you know, to practitioners, to policymakers and all that? What's your thought on that? Um, um, I think when... Uh, actually, there there is a big argument going on about the about the issue that you said. But I think uh, 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 we really have to look at the data first. What what's f to understand what's going on in the forest, rather than just making assumptions and rather than just uh, repeating the same practices that we have done in normal conditions. So heat wave conditions, I mean, increase in temperature actually change a lot. That actually reverse so many things that we thought right. So the things that we thought valid is not is no longer valid in the heat wave conditions and longer. So rather than just saying 
any, we should do this anything, but I think we really have to build up a system first. So I think rather government should be able to provide, for example, like vegetation density is really important to make a correct decision, but which is not available. And for example, vegetation moisture and vegetation heat information is very important to determine like evacuations and whether we have to encourage logging business or we have to suppress down, but it is not available right now. So I think we, at least we need some operational system to provide very important information for policy making first, and then we will make a wise, reasonable decision based upon that. And uh, um, yeah, so so I think there are many rooms for scientists should contribute to. It's not like just downloading available products from space agency and then just just repeat the similar statistics based upon the the, the existing data set. We need really innovative approach, and we really have to suggest the new variables and overcome the technical uh, limitations so that we can provide the data which is required you know necessary for a correct policy making although we can't get over all technical limitation is still important to know uh, what kind of technical limitations we have you know for example like you know when there is a surgeon and you know some surgeon will just cut all the cancers but you know in in every surgery there's a risk and if we are aware of the risk in the decision making we can make a wise decision so although we can't solve all the technical limitations I think it's still important to know where we are whether we are ready for this or not and what kind of limitations we have then I think this isn't making can be different so yes yeah, so to make to make some short answer uh, yeah I think I still uh, there are so many rooms for scientists to contribute to uh, there's a lack of uh, information uh, so I think policymakers are may not be in a position to make a wise decision at this stage. So in other words, simply put, look at the data. And yeah, us, yeah, 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 yeah. And for we, us we, to look we, there at are the so data, many things that we don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. 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 And for us yeah, to so. look at the data, the data yeah. has to be available, you know? Yeah. Yeah, to be to be shared. Like for example, like I said in the beginning of my seminar, you know, governing party pledged to uh, plant two billion trees. That's actually totally ignore the scientific findings yet. Yeah, so we need to share uh, scientific findings with policymakers, and there should be you know very active communications between science and policymakers, so that policymakers can update their knowledge and their uh, thought and perspectives about the carbon sink. So it's not like really straightforward and things are a little bit complicated here on their heat wave situations. However, just not only Paris Agreement, but also, uh, you know, just national party, political party, they don't really update uh, recent five years of a great important change in their uh, decision. So I think first thing is we need to talk. Yeah, scientists need to talk. Uh, yeah, with the policymakers and really have to share important data with policymakers so that they can revise and uh, uh, update their policy. Well, are we, are we not talking? I want to believe scientists are talking. We're publishing, you know, and you know, we, we're we're talking. I just don't tell understand where the disconnect or how we can you know better bridge the gap between science policy and practice um um for some reason although scientists publish a lot but i think which is not read by uh, policymakers of course of course yeah um uh, yeah but i think uh uh, scientists, they just, uh, yeah, um, I think that, yeah, there's a lack of communication between scientists and policymakers. And they just, uh, uh, really, there are a few scientists who would like to actively communicate with the policymakers for various reasons. I think our experts is very difficult 
you know, very different. And it's really, it's really challenging to explain our job and our work to someone who is not doing science. So, uh, so most so majority of scientists go to science conference rather than policy making uh, conference. So I think we need a more venue, more occasion, more conference to meet with uh, policymakers and yeah so actually i want to play my role in this <laughs> okay. yeah in this okay. in the interface between the science and policy yeah um professor clark is asking land models typically solve for skin temperature based on the surface energy balance this includes the ground heat flux which depends on the vertical gradient between the skin temperature and temperature of the upper soil layer the heat equation for soil does include heat capacity. This is a detail of the numerical implementation. The model problems that you mentioned may not be as pronounced as you state. So since no model is perfect, can you comment on the opportunities to assimilate remotely sensed information into mechanistic models to provide a better estimate of vegetation conditions? Um, like I briefly explained today, uh, as far as I know, when the model uh, close energy balance to retrieve land surface temperature, they don't, they don't assimilate uh, vegetation water contents. So you just said that whether there is a way to assimilate satellite observation for that part, uh, the answer is nothing is available operationally. I mean, operationally means is there's no product that you can just download from NASA or ESA website. So, so my research is kind of exploring this approach, but just we only started in 2018 and it's we didn't uh, upload it to the website yet. Uh, uh, but... Um, uh, if you feel, yeah, if you felt interesting, I mean, with this vegetation water content study, I think uh, I can introduce uh, my publications because uh, no satellite observation product is available online at the moment. Uh, so if your study domain is not vegetated, uh, if you're, I mean, I don't know which uh, study domain you are studying, but if it is not covered by forest at least, and I think you can pretty much use land surface temperature. And if the site does not go through, I mean, if, if there's no like, dramatic hydrological change like such as like snow melt you know canada is very tricky place because there's so many complex things going on like snow melt is very unevenly distributed and there's so much so many like forests and these are all the obstacles in estimating in you know land surface temperature so if your study domain it's simple and no forest no snow melt no change in hydrological factors then I think you can pretty much use land surface temperature. Yeah, yeah. It's it can be. Yeah, it will work in uh, stable conditions. However, under heat wave conditions and snow is melting and is covered by forests and that makes things complicated. So if answer, yeah. I mean, I think you can uh, assimilate land, sur uh, land surface temperature at the moment just for uh, yeah for this. Okay, um, I guess you've convinced us that really there's a lot of work to be done here, you know, in terms of the technology involved, you know, we need more data, data needs to keep speaking, and we need to pay attention to what data is saying, you know, so thank you very much for, for the insight and for mm -hmm. calling this out. <laughs> You know that for calling this out and for paying attention to this aspect of um climate change and climate policy, climate action, because there's a global clamoring in this in this regard right now. You know, and I'm sure that um this talk had also inspired you know a lot of you know other groups and experts to you know also pay some attention to you know to factoring in you know all these dynamics you know, into into our policies, you know, for a better world. 
So once again, I say thank you for your time. Thank you for the mm -hmm. insight, you know, and thank you everyone for being a part of yet another um, UNU Inway Science Talk. So hopefully see you next week, Wednesday, for another edition of UNU Inway Science Talk. Bye for now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh